Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Moreland. I uh, teach on the law faculty here at Villanova, and welcome you to our celebration of Constitution Day in 2011. I'll turn the podium briefly over to uh, uh, two people for some welcoming remarks before introducing our uh, lecturer. Uh, first, John Gatanda, the Dean of the Villanova University School of Law, and then Colleen Sheehan in the Department of Political Science and the Director of the Matthew Ryan Center. Thank you and welcome. Today we celebrate Constitution Day and a law school in the shadows of Philadelphia is a really a most fitting place to hold such a celebration in light of the Constitution's origins and its purposes. And I would like to welcome and thank our distinguished speakers, Professor Philip Hamburger and Professor Amy Wax, as well as our partners in this event. And I know we have a lot of our colleagues from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here and the Matthew J. Ryan Center for the Study of Free Institutions and Public Good. And, and I would particularly like to thank today Professor Michael Moreland and Colleen Sheehan who are both instrumental in putting this really great event together. So again, welcome and thank you for coming. Colleen? Thank you very much, John, and thank you to our uh, distinguished speakers for uh, being here today. It is, um, I'd like to thank Villanova Law School in particular for holding this event uh, and in their gracious and, and uh, hospitality in this beautiful new building. Um, especially Dean John Gotanda, Associate Dean Patrick Brennan. Um, we have a number of Ryan faculty associates here at the law school to whom I'm grateful. Uh, David Cadell, Penelope Pether, Michelle Dempsey, Tuan Samahan, Lou Sirico. Um, and I'd also like to especially thank Nicole uh, Garifana and Brenda Hafer, who've done so much to, um, uh, to put together things for this event. But most of all, I noticed on the program that there are a number of names highlighted. And the one name that isn't there is a the person who's done the most for this event, and that's Michael Moreland. Uh, and I want to thank Michael very, very much for um, taking the lead in this and what is sure to be a very interesting conversation this afternoon. If I might just say uh, a word about the Matthew Ryan Center, uh, because it's named after Matthew J. Ryan. Surprise. It's the Matthew J. Ryan Center for the Study of Free Institutions and the Public Good. And Matt Ryan served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives for over 40 years. And for quite some time, he served as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Matt Ryan was a double cat. He went to uh, the undergraduate school, graduated with a BA from Villanova University, and then graduated with a law degree from Villanova Law School. And I had the uh, pleasure of knowing Matt and chatting with him a long time ago about an idea for a center here at Villanova, to which he was, uh, about which he was very excited and to which he was very dedicated. I know Matt would be proud to have his name associated with the excellent speakers and program that Mike Moreland has organized for us today. Um, we have a no number of other events coming up that you might be interested in, and um, uh, many of these events, most of these events are open and free to the public, and I invite you to join us. Um, if you'd like to know about the, the events that we have, uh, you can just put your email uh, down on the paper outside. We won't send you any junk mail. We'll just let you know when things are coming up in case you're interested. Um, I'll give you one example. On October 27th, Dr. Steve Cambone, who was uh, undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence at the Pentagon um, during uh, the fateful day this week, 10 years ago, 9-11. Um, actually, it was af right after 9-11, they created that position to coordinate the CIA with the Pentagon so that intelligence would be coordinated, and uh, they created the position and put him in it. And uh, Dr. Steve Cambone will be here on October 27th to talk about the lessons we can learn from 9-11. Um, it's, it is this week, of course, that we um, are remembering the 10th anniversary of that horrific day. And amidst all the sad stories, and there are many, and there are too many, um, 
But I hope, too, that we remember not just what America stands against, but what America stands for. And what the founders said more often than not was that liberty hangs in the balance. We're dedicated to an experiment, as yet undecided, but the great experiment to see whether mankind is capable of governing themselves. It's to this question, to this experiment, um, that the Matt Ryan Center uh, is dedicated. Thank you for being here with us today. Philip Hamburger is the Maurice and Hilda Friedman Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He is by every account one of the leading constitutional historians in America. His scholarship focuses on constitutional law and its history. His publications include The Magisterial Law and Judicial Duty in uh, 2008 and Separation of Church and State from 2002, both from Harvard University Press. Before coming to Columbia, Professor Hamburger was the John P. Wilson Professor at the University of Chicago Law School where he was director of the Bigelow Program and the Legal History Program. Earlier, he taught at the George Washington University Law School and the Law School at the University of Connecticut and was an associate right here in Philadelphia at Schneider, Harrison, Seagal, and Lewis. He received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his law degree from Yale Law School. In Law and Judicial Duty, Professor Hamburger writes in the conclusion, the difficulty of getting agreement, including agreement on what is reasonable and just in law, is the centrifugal reality of modern life, and although this has prompted men to turn toward authority, it has also led to a division of authority, a division among individuals, among peoples, among states, among the branches of government, and not least between any two of these bodies, such as between an individual and the state. The Anglo-American version in solution of such a problem, accomplished most saliently by means of a constitution, became the primary alternative to the consolidated and almost unlimited state authority that flourished in much of the rest of the world. This was a remarkable achievement, and at least thus far, it has proved singularly well adapted to the modern world. And so it's with delight that Villanova welcomes Philip Hamburger to deliver our 2011 Constitution Day Lecture. Well, thank you all for coming here. Thank you to Villanova for allowing me to talk here. Thank you, Michael, for arranging this. It, it really is a great honor to be here. And thank you, Amy, for coming to comment. I want to talk about censorship and death. This is not, you'd think, a topic that needs to be discussed in the 21st century. Censorship, surely, was something of the past the very distant past, the late medieval and early modern past, and it's surely gone. Surely it's censorship that is dead. Sadly, that isn't so. Um, the censorship I want to talk about today is real censorship. It's not just the occasional, after the fact penalty, the harassment of students. This is all serious enough. Uh, it's not just someone being fired because of their political views. Again, that's very serious. But that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about instead is licensing, the requirement that one get permission to print, to publish, to talk, to read, that one needs to get prior permission from the government or a body authorized by the government to do these very basic things, and to do it not just for one instance, but in multiple instances. Indeed, in institutions across the country, for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. You would have thought that this is some fantasy of the Inquisition of the Star Chamber, but it isn't. It's actually right here with us, indeed, even in this institution, I suspect. Censorship, and in particular licensing, originated in Italy with the Inquisition, and it was designed to protect the dignity of God. To protect God from the cavils of human beings writing in the printed books, the Inquisition required that manuscripts be submitted to the Inquisition for permission before they could be published. And this was the problem that Galileo runs into in, this, in the 1630s, right? When his vision of the universe conflicts with that which preserves the dignity of God. 
And it wasn't that the church was indifferent to his writings. Cardinal Bellarmine actually was quite sophisticated and, fr and friendly with Galileo. But the licensing system prevailed, and Galileo, for violating it, ended up in prison. In England, the same system was adopted for printing, and it was enforced by the Star Chamber. The Star Chamber issued regulations requiring printers and authors to get permission to print and to publish. It required that there be imprimaturs at the front of books, so that the, uh, the opposite the title page of a book, there had to be a statement, the imprimatur, in which it said, I, William Lord, Archbishop of Canterbury, give permission for the following book to be published. Under these regulations, moreover, the government brought the universities in to assist. In a free society, the government can't control everything. So it delegates tasks to institutions like universities. And since academics write a lot, the universities were asked to license the books of academics. This was the system that Milton protested against in his Areopagitica. It's the system that Locke protested against in 1695. And later in 1695, Parliament finally abolished it. It recognized that licensing was arbitrary and barbaric and incompatible with freedom of inquiry in a free society. The First Amendment declares Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, the meaning of this is much disputed. We have entire classes in which we parse the meaning for different aspects of speech. Does it include restrictions on injunctions? Does it apply to post-publication restraints and how? And what do we do with nonverbal expression? such as dancing? Is this protected by the First Amendment? These are all very interesting questions. But notice, they're not as basic as the question we're discussing today. Nothing was disputed about the First Amendment when it as it applied to licensing. There was no, no dispute, and there still is no dispute, that the central meaning of the First Amendment, whatever else it applies to, is that there should be no licensing, absolutely no licensing of speech of the press. You cannot be required to seek prior permission to speak or publish. And this is because the First Amendment was most centrally a rejection of 17th century Star Chamber and Inquisition licensing. That was the main point of the First Amendment, and it was an absolute prohibition on this particular means of suppress controlling the press. My talk is about the return to that licensing of speech in the press. Again, I don't want to talk about just after the fact punishment or small scale harassment appalling as that may be. I want to talk about an entire system of licensing. This new censorship is run through what are called institutional review boards. I'm just have any of you ever heard of them? Put up your hands if you've even heard of these things. Oh, so we have a few people who've encountered these animals. Okay, these institutional review boards, affectionately known as IRBs, when I first heard about these, people were talking about IRBs, I thought, who's herb? And what is this herb all about? Well, I soon learned. These institutional review boards are designed to avoid harm in what's called human subjects research. But what they actually do is create a system of licensing speech in the press. They license talking, they license writing, they license printing and publishing. Now I should say at the outset that there's a certain caveat one needs to keep in mind in all of this about what I'm not talking about. What I do not want to address because it really has little to do with this discussion, is the use of IRBs, institutional review boards, under FDA regulations. The government uses these same institutions, the institutional review boards, to protect human subjects in FDA drug and device trials. That it has its own interesting legal issues, but they're different than the ones here. So the FDA trials, although they're fascinating, we could talk about them if you wish, it's not the subject of this discussion. What I want to talk about instead is the use of in institutional review boards in the different set of regulations, the regulations that apply mostly to academic institutions to protect human subjects of research. So I have four goals today. First, I'd like to talk about the structure of the censorship, just to give you a sense of the institutions involved. Second, I'd like to look at the, uh, the focus of the regulations to see how they focus on speech in violation of the First Amendment, since the constitutional issue. Third, 
We should look at whether or not harm in research justifies IRBs. For whatever the relevance of harm in the constitutional analysis, it still would be relevant to know, is there actually harm out there that might justify some system like this? And then fourth, <coughs> fourth, flipping that question of harm around, do IRBs in their licensing actually cause harm, indeed lethal harm, which sadly is where we'll have to conclude. Let's get some tea. So let's start with the structure of the censorship. There are four layers, and I'd like to run from the top to the bottom, from the government to the universities to the IRBs, and then finally down to individuals, faculty, and students. The first level is the federal government. It assumes that human subjects research is dangerous, very dangerous, and it therefore uses these institutions, institutional review boards, to prevent harm in the so-called human subjects research. The Department of Health and Human Services is the department that sets the standards for licensing in most instances that apply in universities. In fact, 17 agencies or departments apply different um, versions of the so-called common rule, the regulations that because it's shared amongst different agencies, it's called a common rule. Um, but HHS standards are the ones that we can take as prototypical and that I'm working with here. One can multiply this at different agencies, but it's just not worth it after a while. The standards for licensing set by HHS and some others is the minimum standard for licensing. Inst individual review boards and other institutions can set higher standards for licensing, can constrain even more, but the minimum standards are set by the federal government. And these standards in this licensing, the standards for it, are imposed in three ways. First, and this is the, what's best known about this, is that it's a condition of research grants. When the government issues any money, any of these 17 agencies give any money to a research institution for research, it is a condition of the grant that the institution first provide the government with a so-called assurance, stating that it has a system of IRBs and that it will impose it on its faculty and students. We can go into more detail later if you want on how it does it and the complicated structure of these assurances, but there's probably a limit to how much administrative law you really want to know. And so I'll spare you at least on this one. We are gonna dig into it later. But on the question of assurances and how they're structured, just take my word for it. And if you want more, I'll happily share details. But that's not all. That's just the first way this is imposed. And it's important that we see there are other ways because conditions and their significance constitutionally is pretty complicated. A second way these, this licensing is imposed is actually through state negligence law. This may seem rather odd because it's the federal government imposing this on institutions. Why does state negligence law come in? Well, in the 1970s, the clever folks at HHS figured out that although it's useful to use conditions on government grants, you could actually leverage these a little bit because if you have a lot of conditions on a lot of institutions, you could make the licensing and the use of IRBs at a particular standard set by the government to be the standard of care for research, as they would put it. Now, whether there is a standard of care for research is an interesting question because research is not in itself a profession. But this was the goal of government, and they make this explicit in internal reports. And so as a result, now, even without conditions, universities and other academic institutions have to go ahead and impose licensing with IRBs for fear of negligence law. So state negligence law actually is now the primary force behind this. Um, and then, of course, there's a third mechanism to impose all of this, which are the state statutes. Many states now have statutes saying that if the federal government does not apply our, require IRB licensing, then the statute requires it. Now, all of this is interesting for purposes we not linger on here. Um, just to put, for those of you who are lawyers, note that the, the, the government action behind all of this, although it's federal at the conditions level, when you get to the state st negligence law and statutes, it's state action. And that, of course, is a delight to a litigator's ear, right? Because it's a reminder that there may be remedies down the road, which the federal government hadn't really thought through when it wanted to shift to state action. At any rate, for now, we need only note that universities feel obliged to impose licensing, and many on their websites make quite clear that they think it's required by law. And although you can't point to a, stat, a federal statute that says so, they're clearly quite right in thinking that this is the effect of the law. Okay, 
Enough for the government for the moment. Let's look at universities, the second level of this. Universities, and indeed all research institutions, uniformly cooperate in the licensing. They're not unlike the English universities of the 17th century, which were all too pleased to help out the Star Chamber in imposing licensing, because they feel there's certain consequences, obviously, that they don't, legal consequences. So what do they do? They establish these institutional review boards. These are committees that meet at least once a month, or sometimes twice a month, um, and they have their own little research bureaucracy around them. In fact, increasingly universities create an entire research bureaucracy not only under the IRBs but above them. Many universities now have uh, provosts or vice presidents for research and they oversee research as if it's sort of a corporate enterprise rather than an individual one and one of their main goals is to make sure that you comply with the IRBs and the licensing. So it's an entire bureaucracy that's invested in this. What do, the, what do they do? Well, the IRBs require faculty and students to comply with the licensing, to submit their proposals for permission before investigating or, or publishing. How do they do this? Well, they make threats. On university websites for the IRBs, they will say in a bland, anodyne, bureaucratic language, if you fail to comply, there will be serious consequences. And you know, academics can imagine what that is, but you don't have to imagine because a number of universities actually will have, have pursued with those consequences. Faculty get fired if they do not comply. If the, if the, fac if the university does not want to go with outright firing, they will simply harass you till you leave, which has happened to a number of very distinguished uh, professors. Um, students just won't be able to graduate. And then they just disappear because they don't want to pay for another year, and so they just go away. Uh, and it's all really rather unpleasant. In fact, it reminds you of the mechanisms used, well, in the 90s.